Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, security. Okay, here we go. Um, hey, hey, Tulsa. Hi. Let's see. How you doing? All right. How are you? I can't hear you. Oh, you can't? You okay. might want to turn your sound up. Oh. Oh, wait. I'm the one who's at fault here. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you well now. I just, for some reason, my sound was turned off. Okay. So, um, how you doing? I'm fine. Um, are you going to have just the panelists show or everyone show? Well, I don't know how to um, make it happen where everybody sh shows. I haven't been able to do that before. Um, so it might be everybody. Hey, how you doing, Hunter? Hi, Hunter. Everybody. Um, yeah, uh, you don't know how to do that, Jerry? No, if somebody can teach me, that would be great. Preferences. Let's see, under preferences, let's see. Um, where would it be? Share, not share screen. Yeah, and you just, um, you know, I did it. I mean, I don't think I can do this under duress right now. I don't think I, I can do any instruction. Um, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, have to I figure have out to get my profile and stuff. Because yeah, oh, I said people. you might see it. Do you see it in the preferences? Um, hide non-video participants. Yes. Spotlight my video when speaking. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. We've got seven minutes for me to figure this out. So, you know how to do it, Hunter? What? Do what? Uh, I was just thinking, you know, it might get really crowded if you let everybody's video, you know, I think it should just be the panelists that are shown. Yeah. I know that it, it works. Uh, uh, as long as you mute them, it could be a lot of people. It could be over a hundred. Oh yeah, I can. I, I can. I can unmute the video. I can basically turn off their but video. But I mean, in the preferences, I think. Um, Just make sure you mute them, or they're all going to be chipping in while we're talking. Yeah, you want them muted. And yeah, everybody's going to be muted. Well, except for the panelists. For us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I'm, I need to be higher in my chair. I need a high chair. You can you tilt you can tilt your screen forward a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I did. I sort of shuffled oh, it around. Okay, that's a little better. Yeah. It's not that it's not that it's not ideal, right? We want our people back. We want to yeah, back we want to be we, we want to actually be able to see. I totally people. want our people back. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just kind of looking at my lighting. We're like in the in the world of Hollywood Squares forever. Yeah. Are there only four of us? There's there's four of us. There's Edward, Hunter, Tulsa, and um Jean. Um uh, and Kal um Kalima Gaston. Yeah, put that in front of you so you well, I have Jean, I have Jean, but I don't have Kalina and I don't have Edvard. She hasn't she hasn't come she hasn't uh, come in yet. And Edvard? Um, I'm trying to, Edward is, Edward called me earlier. Um, his um, assistant is putting him online. Um, so we'll, we've got five minutes. People usually People are usually short. start late yeah, or short. They'll, they'll get in at the last minute. Do you have a lot of people for this jury? Usually I do. Um, I promoted this one just as much as always, and uh, oh, so here comes did, Edward. Oh, so you didn't just have the participants on the panel, uh, the only ones you could see? Hi, Edward. I haven't figured that out yet. Oh, well, I guess I could. Um, Let me look it up. 
Okay. Yeah, we should all be wearing masks, right? <laughs> well, no. This is the one time we don't have to. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can chime in. You want to say hello? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies hey, Edward, and gentlemen. Edward, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Hi, Edward. Hello, oh, there's Clayton. Right there. Hi, Clayton. Hey. How are you? All right, just finished the newsletter. I have already had a very busy day. Emailed you. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering what this is about. <laughs> yeah, uh, does anybody know how to tell? Um, I, well, it doesn't I, matter. I, you know, I. You'll just have to figure it out for next time. Yeah, I'm pretty much. Christine is joining. Daniel, Daniel's joining. Um, I'm going to, uh, don't worry, I'm not leaving. I'm just going to get a glass of water to make sure that. We may all get used I, to this. We may not have to go anywhere. Uh, I just had to turn down a trip seeing family on the East Coast. I mean, I'm, it's horrible. I hate it. It's going to, it's. It's all, it's, I think it's also horrible for everybody because there's just there's a, no end in sight, right? I mean, everybody right. thought by now there'd be, it would be different, so. Right, I mean, I thought, um, I mean, reading the paper today, we still, there's, it's not going down. No, no, we can't, I was looking at the travel bans today, we can't go anywhere anyway. Oh, no really? No well, I mean, more. abroad, you mean? Abroad, we can't, well, we can't even go to New York, you know that, right? There. Well. Right, but they don't let you. Are you saying? I mean, why would you? But I mean, are you saying you have to quarantine, guys? Well, is, the, are they saying you have to quarantine if you come to? You know, you can't come to New York City, right? That that I don't know. I wasn't aware of that because people were. I mean, all over the country, they're trying to prevent other people to come from coming. Right, I know. Like I was right. telling you, my uh, you know brother-in-law and to the East Coast. I'm like. <laughs> I can't come to the East Coast. Hi, Eve. Hi, Tulsa. <laughs> How are you? Hi. Did everyone uh, read Daniel. Eve Brown's uh, Eve Brown Eve Woods uh, <laughs> Shit Brown, uh, the color of Shit Brown today? It's on our website. It's very good. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Uh, <laughs> we don't um, have, uh, all right. So yet. we've got a couple of minutes before we're starting, which is cool. I'm excited. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Here comes Kalima. Hi, Kalima. Uh, where's she at? She's connecting. Hi, Kalima. Hi. I'm, this is Yuri right here. How's it going? Wait, let me let me see if she's muted or not. Um, I'm just blinding myself here. Okay, Kalima, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Kalima? I don't necessarily see you yet. I mean, she's oh, down here at the bottom. Now. Kalima, can you hear me? I hear you just fine. I just don't oh. see you. I'm right oh, up here at the top. You don't see any of us? Yep. OK. I can only see like the first two rows, but I see you now. Oh, OK, great. Very. Hey, how you doing? I'm OK, amazing. so we'll get started in a couple of minutes. I mean, okay. in a minute here, we'll start right on time. This is recording, so anybody who can't see it today can come to the website and look, at, look at it later. We we have a bunch Hi. of people coming in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Hi. I'm gonna I'm gonna Hi. mute everybody that um I'm gonna mute everybody that everybody who's not on the panel. Um, either mute yourselves or I'm gonna mute you just to make it easier for us to hear everything. Um because that sometimes happens. Everybody's okay. done that. I appreciate that very much, me? everyone. Um, Yuri? I believe everybody's unmuted, the people who were on the panel, which okay. is great. Um, OK, here we are. It's 1 o'clock. So welcome to Art Media Under Lockdown and Beyond. 
Uh, we have an, an exceptional panel today. Um, I'm going to start with Tulsa Kinney. She's the um, editor of Artillery Magazine, which is the most successful LA magazine that we've have, that we've had, which is fantastic and well, thank probably you the for only one readable. That hyperbole, but thank you anyway. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, so tells us here to talk to her, talk to us about what's going on with her magazine, and um, Hunter Dro Yehoska Philp is here. Oh, she yeah. is. Um, <laughs> the editor uh, the author of rebels in paradise about the city the art in los angeles in the 60s and also a definitive uh, biography of georgia o'keefe i'm not don't have the title in front of me but she's here welcome we have kalima gaston who is yep. the uh entrepreneur actress writer and producer who um runs a uh, a networking program for filmmakers in an art gallery in Atlanta. And um, among other things, and we have Edward Goldman, who formerly um, was the host of the long running art talk on KCRW, which ran from, I believe, 1988 till they think last year, I believe. Correct. And now he runs Art Matters. And uh, I believe that is our panel. Um, I'm very excited to um, be talking with all of you. We've got some great people in the audience and I'm um, excited about this, um, this thing. Um, the, I think the first, the first, the thing that really mattered to, matters to me right now, personally, um, is the need for a new government uh, the need for an understanding of what um, a police state looks like um, and how we need to avoid that at all costs. Um, and also um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is a key part of that uh, growth as a country that I believe we're taking. And it's, it's basically really, really important because the Black Lives Matter movement has taken place in the middle of a health crisis, the COVID thing, which we're all here on Zoom because of. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd like to start with um, Tulsa, and I'd like to ask you how, if, how your messaging as a media maker is changing or staying the same or how is it being driven, if at all, by the, by the, um, what's going on in our world? Well, um, you know, I run Artillery, and a uh, contemporary art magazine, and uh, the thing about Artillery is it's really been um, a magazine that always addresses, uh, you know, current uh, issues, uh, just always. I mean, if I've had painting, abstract painting, uh, you know, in the uh, lineup for our summer issue, I would have definitely changed it. I mean, I would, I just wouldn't have done that. So I really, um, it's very important uh, to me as editor, and I believe all of my, uh, you know, all of our readers are very like-minded. Uh, that's a lot of problem with, uh, you know, platforms is usually you're preaching to the choir, but, you know, that should stop you. But anyway, uh, so I just finished the issue, uh, Artillery. I'll just show you right now and what I'm doing. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, as uh, most people know, uh, in the publishing world, you have your lineup or assignments made well in advance. Uh, we already had our summer issue or May issue, which we didn't print because we didn't have any funds, but we went to summer and it was called our changing art world. So we already had some articles that were quite prescient. Um, we already had our uh, cover artists already picked out uh, Otis uh, Kwame Kweko. I might not be pronouncing that right. He's from uh, 
He's Portland based, but now lives in um, Africa and he shows with uh, Robert's Project. But also inside the magazine, uh, like every other article, really deals with uh, our current uh, issues, the state of the world right now. Uh, Brandy Eve Allen uh, addresses the uh, pandemic. She's a photographer, artist that went around taking portraits in um, outside of people's houses. Uh, I have Alexia Lewis who talks to Keisha Bruce about uh, a conversation about being a black woman artist in today's art world. And I guess so to answer, I don't have to go through the entire magazine, I guess just kind of answer your question is, um, I feel like, you know, it's my responsibility as an art editor uh, in LA to respond to uh, what is happening in the art world today. And I think artists right now also, I'm not saying all artists have to put down their brushes and now just, uh, you know, paint about only uh, COVID and BLM, but I'm saying, we, uh, if that's not your style or whatever, but we just need to address all these things because they're super important and they affect everyone in the world. And I want uh, artillery not to be an exception and be used as a platform to address these uh, very, very important issues. And um, I try to do my part that way. Cool. Um why don't we ask uh, go to Kalima now? Why don't you talk a little bit about what your um, networking practice is and how you have come to um, you know how your summer's been going and what you're working on? Hi guys, so I'm Kalima Gaston and I'm from New York City originally. I just moved to LA from Atlanta, where I did create Screening Room ATL, which is a networking event but more so it's an indie platform for indie filmmakers um, it's a great place to gather and utilize each other for tools that we may need for making our films whether it's post or um, just collaborations and the idea is to really get our art out there we've been doing that for actually this friday will be four years i started it in, a, in atlanta 2016 and then i brought it here last year september to la and it's been going really well in, in terms of creating a conduit um, so that way artists can come to LA and vice versa and knowing that they have somewhere to meet people and really connect and show their work. Um, it has been an amazing time running it until COVID. And, you know, of course we have so many avenues like Zoom and we have, of course, um, Twitch is what I've been using actually. Twitch is a gamer site, but it has more freedom in terms of how you can utilize it and. I can talk into the, the mic and they can hear me. There's a chat on the side, like it's very interactive. They can see me if I choose for them to see me. Twitch has been going well to create virtual meetings, but it's just not quite the same. Um, and we've always lived in a digital world. I just think that it's very important to keep the connection of meeting people and getting to know people and feeling energy because most times when we're on set for hours, we wanna work with people we like and we don't know who we really like until we've been around them. So it's just really a, a great tool to be able to kind of suss someone out and see how you feel about them, whether or not you may know their capabilities in terms of um, their work, you still used to know that you like them. So that's that's been the, the biggest blessing that has come out of it. Uh, virtually, the biggest blessing is to be able to reach more markets, I guess, essentially, uh, like New York. I'm from New York originally, so more people can actually view what I'm doing online. Atlanta's group can jump in with New York group people, and what I try to do is just keep it very like, hey, put your Instagrams, make sure you're following each other, make sure to really connect in real time, keep in touch, let's really still create through this. Uh, the summer has been great. My film that I actually made about a year and a half ago um, has been in three film festivals and it's been extremely bittersweet. You know, I'm very grateful for my first film to be in these festivals. However, my first time as a filmmaker to have them be virtual film festivals are like, what is that? You know, you go for the experience, you wanna meet people and say, hey, I have a filmmaker badge. And now I'm like, I'm going to meet all of you online, like I'm doing now. So it's very weird and just trying to adjust to it all. But I'm very grateful for, you know, having the means to get through it. Yes, I, I, I agree 100%. Um, we put our film festival online this year, and it was a big learning curve for us. We put 92 films online. We had them on, on for a week on Vimeo. Mm. 
and um, it, from 27 countries. Um, wow. There was one that was called Enough Enough, Enough is Enough that focused on Black Lives Matter done by mm. an artist named Sai, who's, um, who is a very, a very good friend of mine and a lead actress in a movie I produced. So, you know, the learning curve for putting all these films online was huge for me. Um, and so it has been a lot of hard work, but it's also a reminder um, of the, the need to be closer as, as often yeah. as we can, um, to your point. Um, Hunter, how about you? Um, I just reread your book again for the second time or third time um, this last week and then loaned it to a friend, so I don't have it to hold up. But um, um, tell us what's going on with you. What kind of projects do you have going? There it is. Yes. It's a fantastic book. It's very, it's, very it's, it's, it's a, you know, go ahead anyway, Hunter. Well, it's about LA in the 60s. And, uh, you know, of course, there's a whole chapter in there that's parallel to what we're going through right now. I mean, it does have, there are like many chapters on various aspects of who lives when and where and does what during 1958 to 1968 Los Angeles. But of course, a defining moment there was, of course, the Watts uprising. So that's part of it. But what I'm doing now, thanks to Grand Central Art Center, is there's a second, I, I have my own website under my name, but in the course of uh, catching up with myself, I started work on uh, LA after 1968 and start to come up, I was doing like a little epilogue for a reprint of the book. The ep it's like the epilogue becomes a book in a way. I just did some work on the 70s that started to grow out. So if it doesn't have no, we have them. I'm, I'm trying to turn off somebody's. Okay. Mind. That's really, that's, that's cool. So, um, I should have done that thing where you go, can you hear me? <laughs> no, no, no. I got it. I got it. Um, I, you know, tell us a little bit of, in detail about this, 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 um, the thing that you just brought up. Well, you know, John Spiak at Grand Central Arts Center reached out and said, you know, how can we help you keep continuing to get the word out? And uh, it forced me to go back and look at a lot of my own archives and articles. And as many of you know, those articles go back to 1979. Hello, Daniel Zimbaldi, I see you there. And a lot of you guys go back to that, that time frame too. So I went back and looked at these articles and I was really struck by how much of it is you know, in many, many ways, LA relives its own history over and over again, but because there's so little defined uh, information about it in, in books and wh whatever, that people just don't know the history and new people keep coming to LA and they kind of recreate, keep reinterpreting a history that, uh, that they don't necessarily fully understand. So the point is, if you go to beyondrebels.com, you're seeing some articles that I'm putting out that are about you know, I'm actually kind of reposting some of my old stuff and one and but with new commentary. And the most recent one was on Jim Iserman and Roger Herman, who happened to be in a show at Pras de Blood. And as some of you know, I've written about them many, many times over the years. I thought, well, let's go back and find that early, those early articles about Jim Iserman and, my, and Roger Herman. And let's find, I mean, how many people know that Jim Iserman took a, a motel room at the end of tomorrow in 1982 and took all the furniture out and re recreated the, he recreated his own furniture for the Disney, for the, the 60s motel in a way recreating a kind of futuristic Jetsons-like environment. Uh, it's too complicated to explain. But the point is, I do think it's interesting to keep taking my own history as a writer and making it available again to people if they want to go there. And our buddy Gordy Grundy is putting it out on the art reports. So it actually has another kind of platform or life of its own. That's really cool. It's <laughs> um, a lot of information. No, no, that's very cool. Um, so beyondrebels.com. And then the Gordy Grundy is putting it on what again? The art? Gordy Grundy has a thing called the art report where he, it's, it's oh, yeah. an aggregate site where he brings in articles by all sorts of people and reviews and gossip and this and that. And he, it's a pretty, it's pretty good. He's been doing it for a couple of years. He's pretty, got a lot of stuff on there. It's not just from LA, it's from all over the world, but it's, uh, it's, he, he, I, he's been reposting it. So it goes to a, a larger audience than I'm, I don't seem to be, I don't seem to be as, as good on developing the platforms as some of my colleagues. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a real challenge to, I mean, it's a crowded field out there for um, media, 
Um, but at the same time, it's important to break through with something that's unique. And it sounds, I didn't know that you had been doing that with your older writing. And I think that's really great. One of the things, um, and I, to finish, I'm going to come back to the, to that in a minute, but I'd like to talk to Edward Goldman and have you um, tell us what you've been up to, how your Art Matters project is going, and um, how, how has the Black Lives Matter and COVID um, affected your, your work process, if any, if, if, and if, if I'm assuming it has, but um, how does that fit into your world? How it affected <clears throat> my life and my connection with the art. I used to say that um, judging art, only seeing it on my computer screen, it's like if you believe in marriage by proxy, you can make a judgment about art just seeing only photographs or the email. But last few months, you know, going to museums became no issue. And um, seeing some of the exhibitions in the galleries was so difficult. So I started to push myself and try to see, mm, can I judge book by its cover? Can I just decide if I like the piece without seeing the piece in actual time, in actual place? And I have to admit that on a few occasions, seeing the email coming from one of the Los Angeles galleries, I thought, hmm, it's intriguing and attractive. Let me go to see it. And most of the time when I went to the gallery, and it was arranged appointment, you know, the galleries right now are very careful. They don't want more than a few people at the same time. And most of the time I found out that my impression, the first impression was rather correct. And now when I see the art in a real gallery, in real time, I like it even more. And I learn about the artists even more. So I became kind of a little bit less skeptical. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few days if everything again is going to be locked because uh, some of the museums announce that they uh, invite people. Huntington Library, for example, announced that people again invited to go and to enjoy a variety of ama amazing gardens there. Uh, the art galleries are closed, but all the gardens in the Huntington open. And I'm looking forward to this Saturday. I hope I cross my fingers that it's still kind of uh, going to be real. I, I have a me, uh, visit uh, to the Huntington with two friends of mine, seeing all the gardens. And the Japanese garden has installation, temporary sculptural installation by uh, Lita Albuquerque. And I'm very eager to see it in real time, in real place, though in my weekly newsletter, Art Matters with Edward Goldman. I already published the photograph of this installation, but I'm going to see it for the first time. Wow, and it, so um, yeah, I really enjoyed, I, I really enjoy Art Matters. Um, it's, a, it's a great outlet for you to, 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 to talk about um, the things that matter to you, of course. Um, do, you, do you find that the, um, that the public the publication has gotten more in depth as a result of COVID. Um, I allow myself a little bit more uh, kind of personal communication with my audience compared to a little bit more formal uh, art uh, letter that I've been. Uh, pub uh, publishing during the many years, doing my art talk on KCRW. Uh, I allow myself to go to the studio of the artists and to talk about these visits kind of on a personal level right now. Uh, by the way, uh, two weeks ago, I went to the studio of Lita Albuquerque and I've seen a number of the works in her studio that just prepares me how she uh, started to work on this installation in Huntington Library. Last week I went to um, the studio of Rene Petropolis, wonderful Los Angeles artist whom I know for a number of years, though I haven't seen her works for 
quite a number of years, and I was absolutely taken by that. And in my upcoming next week, um, Art Matters, I'm going to show some of the works and some of the stories that she shared with me. So yes, I have a privilege to call to the artists whom I know for a number of years, and they just ask me how I'm doing, and I promise that I'm doing well, and I'm going to wear masks, and so we are keeping safe distance, no hugging, no kissing. That's what I'm saying to all my friends and all my contact, no hugging, no kissing. But let's talk. And um, talk we do. And um, uh, I'm still, I want to share the story how at the very beginning of coronavirus, knowing that I cannot go to museums and galleries, I just put on my newsletter photographs of my personal collection in my apartment in Santa Monica. And I said, okay, I need to look at art. I need to connect with art. Let me tell you a little bit about the artworks surrounding me and supporting me. And I said, if you have something in your house that you want to share with me, please send me your favorite works in your house. And with your permission, I'll share it with my large audience. And I was surprised. I was getting information from people in Los Angeles, people whom I know personally, people whom I don't know personally. So people were sending me from Europe, from London, from Paris, and I put it on my art matters. So there is a way to keep connection with the art. And for me, it just keeping in touch with all the gods and angels of Los Angeles. Oh, that's that's a really good story. I mean, I I believe in um, I believe people as a result of the COVID are more anxious for communication, more anxious for friendship and um, companionship. Um, a little uh, more anxious. I think I've been I've read more during. Well, I'm I'm a pretty big reader a lot, and so what I've really enjoyed about COVID is the ability to read more and actually have the time to think about it because my schedule isn't, I'm still working just as hard, but it feels like I have more time to think about what I'm reading. And, if, if, and I didn't think that was possible. So I'm going to go back to Tulsa and ask her, um, one of the things that really um, is important, I think, is to um, recognize the value of the written word in terms of um, our situation now, because often we're if we're not communicating by phone or on Vimeo, we're we're reading what other people are writing, and I know a lot of writers are are writing more. So how do you how do you see that that whole process of of getting your message out in your magazine? Um, how do you how do you see that? in terms of the idea of the written word being even more important? Um, well, I think um, it's an opportunity now that everyone's kind of glued to their uh, social media um, and uh, their devices that uh, the written word can be even more powerful uh, because uh, people are really just you know, kind of glued to the uh, internet and everything. So I think it's a great platform and uh, it's always been very important. I mean, is it more important now? I mean, that kind of seems kind of silly. I mean, I'm a, a journalist. I started a magazine. I'm, you know, my late husband was a journalist. I know journalists. I used to work at the LA Weekly. So uh, I felt like it's one of the most important things kind of in the world, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, without reading or information, it's a way of, uh, you know, gathering information. So uh, it, it just can't be any more important. And um, I don't know if I'm answering that question. No, I, just, I think that's, uh, I think that pretty, I think that covers it. I mean, I think that's a really excellent way of describing it. One of the things that um, I've also feel, felt um, is that film, um, you know, is one of the most seamless um, 
forms of art on the internet. And I'd like Kalima to talk about that in terms of how, um, how the, how you feel that, I mean, I think you probably agree with me that film is actually more suited to the COVID situation than some other forms in, in addition to reading and in addition to the written word. So the question is, do I think that film is um, more important as an art form during COVID? Well, I, what I mean is, is I, I do, how do you, I mean, do you agree that film is a, um, a seamless form of art in terms of the internet, in terms of the ability to see what the artist intended? Oh, you know, yes, for sure, because you have every aspect as far as, far as visual, you have the audio, and then you get to also see images um, and not just people reacting. But I don't know, lately it feels like, you know, the podcast forum and also the Zoom forum and the forum of just hearing voices is a little bit more stronger for me these days, only because, I mean, the first few months we, we watched everything on Netflix, we watched everything on Hulu. And then you feel like, what else is there to watch that I haven't already seen or a variation of what I haven't already seen? Um, and if you're fortunate, people are still creating through this. But then you have this overwhelming feeling of, am I being irresponsible by filming through this? Because, you know, we don't need to be gathered or how am I going to get this, this, and this with, with a crew or what have you? So I do think that it's a very poignant uh, way of showing art, of course. But I think that through this time, it's easier and more efficient and even for me better right now to just hear things opposed to just seeing them because we all have our own imaginations. And so I, I have a better imagination than what you could tell me. You know, if, if you give me the image, that's all I've got. But if I'm listening to it or reading it even, I'm creating the world for myself. And so I'm, I'm kind of enjoying that a little bit more than I used to. Um, I'm not a huge fan of audiobooks. But lately, I can just listen to more audio things than I, than I used to be able to. I'm just feeling inundated with so much content, whether it's social media or watching these apps with uh, TV and stuff, that I kind of want to take a rest. And then reading, I love to read, but it'll put me to sleep after so much time. <laughs> so at least with audio, I can kind of stay with it, you know? Interesting. Um, um, I would like um, to... Um, to ask, um, what do you, what do you see? What does each of you, I mean, I, I'm assuming that um, uh, the process of, of making media is well in hand and that it's a constant thing for, the, for the, all of us. Um, what projects would you like to do, um, do you have in mind for the future? Um, and we can start with Hunter. I know you've told me that you're going back through your older stuff, but what have you got, what have you got up your sleeve for the future when uh, this whole thing, when we're actually being able to, to, I don't know how long it's going to take for us to not be social distancing anymore, but when that time comes, what do you, what would you like to be doing? Well, you know, as you know, I was with KCRW for almost a decade as well. And the whole time I was doing the radio, I kept thinking, this is great. I love being on the radio, but, Actually, I like the whole time there's also a written piece for every single, you know, art talk that I did, same as Edward, you know, so it, and I really, when I, when we stopped doing that, it really put me back in touch with the fact that I'm a writer and that I am, will be continuing oh. to write. And I think there's a great shortness of coverage in terms of, I'm hoping I'll be doing a book that'll be like about LA in the 70s and early 80s. A lot of what happens in LA now is defined by that decade, just as the 70s itself was defined by, the 60s was defined by the 50s. And it really isn't that clear. The connections just aren't that clear. And I, I think it's worth exploring. And uh, writing is depth to me. Reading and writing are depth. And uh, what I, thanks to COVID, what I got to do was read, you know, Ninth Street Women, which is an account of the women, the women abstract expressionist painters of the 30s, 40s, 50s. And there it's like a group biography, which I obviously love. And instead of just one Lee Krasner biography, it's all these women together. And it is, it's exactly up what I what I love to do and what I love to read. Who knew who? What where did they go? Where did they eat? What did they talk about? How did they get that show? And how many of you mm -hmm. knew that John Bernard Myers was a marioteer did did puppet, puppetry? You know, I mean, it's there are these little details that make reading so rich and it's so 
much something that is not available to me in little snippets of sound bites or things that are floating around on social media that are uh, fun, you know, but not really deeply satisfying to me. And what about you, Edward? What, what, when, when, this, when the COVID thing, um, when we were, when able to be back together again, what have you got up your sleeve in terms of um, future plans? Have you started thinking about that kind of stuff? I'm not sure that I have anything up my sleeve, but in my mind, my crazy mind, I'm hoping again that I will be able not just to inform and teach my audience, sharing with my audience some kind of information, but speak to my audience. I, I'm dreaming about with a camera, going to the studio of the artist and talking with them in a lifetime, in real time, and talking with them and arguing with them and okay, well, um, asking them they can see who's in it, right? personal questions about how much their life is reflected in what they're doing as an artist. Yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really important, I mean, I just, I would have to concur with what Kalima said, and also what Jean's, what um, Hunter said, because both of those things have become more accentuated when our, um, when, they say that when people senses, they lose the sight, they lose the sense of sight, that their, their hearing gets more accentuated, their hearing becomes better. Um, or when they lose their ear, hearing, their sight becomes better. I'm not sure if I've got that right. But I do know that there's a, a relationship between what's, what we don't have and, and how we're communicate, how we're um, relating to our world. Um, this sort of isolation has created a, a whole, a whole host of interesting circumstances, including the one we're in right now. Um, uh, Tulsa, the question I have for you is, um, how do you feel, uh, this is sort of a, the, one of the questions somebody was thinking about, but um, I mean, there, for me, there's never gonna, there, there's nothing that's ever gonna replace holding a book in my hands or a piece of, or, or a newspaper, you know, or a, or, a, or a magazine like the New Yorker when it comes, you know? Um, I, I think that like having a physical thing to touch helps form the, the intimacy that a media does. So uh, you're, a, you're a magazine that has to be run mostly online, but of course the printed issues are still going out to folks. And so how do you feel like um, that might work out when COVID is over? I mean, are you, are you planning on expanding your print run? Do you see, um, you know, the online thing being more important after the there after COVID, or let or just are we going to go back to the way it's been before? Well, I'm I'm just an advocate of uh, print. Uh, I'm really like uh, also just the visual, the um, you know layout, the art. Uh, graphic arts. It's an art form, in my opinion. I mean, uh, I don't think that the web can ever uh, duplicate that. And I'm, you know, but I'm, you're talking to someone that is, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my age, but, you know, I grew up with books and magazines. I still prefer a book. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends read on Kindle and that kind of thing. I just, I don't want to do that. I like the book. So uh, I don't know that COVID has, I mean, probably COVID has, uh, you know, affected it a bit because, uh, you know, right now uh, my magazine is not on the uh, newsstands. Uh, we had to stop that. Uh, the newsstands closed, the museum bookshops, all those kind of things are closed. So uh, we're really pushing to order the magazine online and we've got new subscribers. And so I just think that media's, um, I, you know, I don't know, it probably will, you know, it will probably disappear. Probably newspapers, probably mm -hmm. magazines, uh, probably books will really disappear. You know, I mean, I'm not very hopeful about much these days, but I, you know, um, I didn't get to answer the first question, you know, one of your questions that I, I don't mind if, I hope you don't mind if I'd like to answer it. Oh, absolutely. I, absolutely. Okay, well, like, uh, would I have some projects? I, I, I just wanted to say that I think it's very, 
you know, important that people do, uh, you know, pay attention to really what is going on in the world, especially, I mean, COVID is maybe going to hopefully go away and we'll get a vaccine. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think the, you know, systemic uh, racism is going to go away very soon. So I really think that that's something that I think um, everyone has a um, responsibility to do. And, um, you know, like, you know, Hunter, if you're going to do your book, I hope that you will uh, make sure to get people of color in it. Um, I'm trying to do that with my magazine. I'm really trying to get more uh, people of color, uh, of writers, black writers. I'm uh, reaching out like that. And I just think that um, we have to really pay attention to that right now. And I think that COVID is a horrible thing that's happening right now, but COVID will go away. and. Um, I don't think the race issue is going to go away very soon uh, unless we just keep on it. We can't ignore it. I just wanted to say that. Uh, here, here. Agreed. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I want to open it up to, we're getting near the end of the panel now. And so I'm going to, I'm going to open it up to questions. What I'd like you to do is if you have a question, um, type a quick question into the chat box. And then um, we'll, and, or you can raise your hand um, and ask a question of any of the panelists. I, I can probably see most of you raise your hand as well. Um, we have some people joining, um, but um, if anybody's got anything, any comments or questions for an indiv yes. individual or to all of us. I think you can unmute people now. A member of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, somebody's got their um, news on. Um, I'm going to try to find out who's, but if anybody has a question, by all means, I'll unmute you, no problem at all. Um, there's Stuart. He's, he's muted now. Um, thanks for coming, Stuart. Um, so uh, any, anybody, any questions at all? Jody, you have a question. Go ahead. Let me unmute you. You know, I think it's been an interesting Certainly uh, stimulating. Oh, am I yeah, go okay? Ahead, go ahead. Go ahead okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for Hi. doing this panel today. Um, I think it's interesting to hear the back and forth talking about written versus being online. Personally, I think that the books are going to be more because people want to touch things. That's my own personal reflection. Um, for each of the panelists, my question to you is. Um, do you think there might be a possibility of a new way of connecting besides Edmund's, you know, wonderful reflections about going into the studio with each of the artists? You know, I certainly enjoy it when people come, but about perhaps uh, creating new ways of collaboration of the written word with pictorial where it's in book form and bringing back the idea of touch and renewing it instead of this Fahrenheit 451 idea where we each you know, memorize books in order to keep books in our head perhaps. But um, you know, for each of you, my question is, um, is there a more hopeful way of, of going forward um, because now that the earth is resetting itself and maybe sitting us each down and telling us, okay, you need to pause, everything's falling apart and I'm just putting you all on time out. Maybe this is a, a time that, is there a way you could possibly look forward in a positive sense to collaborate in a new way? And what are your thoughts on that? And what are the possibilities that you yourself think you could do? to make things come together and connect. So that as Edmund put it, we will all be connecting versus just giving up and going into our room and watching Netflix. Yeah, I, I just, well, personally, I think, personally, I think, um, you know, whenever there's a, a problem, a, a major situation, a major historical event, um, people are always trying to learn how to do things new and different, yeah. and I think collaborative, coll the idea of, of collaborating more is a key part of that. Um, listening more as well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 
So anybody else in the panel wanna, wanna talk about that? Um, maybe Kalima, you might have an idea. Yeah. So I think that already, you know, there has been a lot of Zoom movies, which I've seen, um, all kinds of different, even on shows, you know, like I've seen uh, All Rise on CBS and they had a Zoom episode. And this was like in the beginning of quarantine, like they figured it out quickly. I just think that, you know, that can only last for so long before those storylines get old, but it is a part of our new world of what this is. So as much as we may not want to see it or don't want to believe it, this is the way television is going to go and film is going to go. Um, as some people may know, Tyler Perry is filming already. He started about two weeks ago. I mean, he has a self-sustained studio, so he has the room and the means to do it. I, I can't imagine every other studio wanting to do that, like a Warner Brothers or a Disney or whomever. And honestly, his studio is what, five times any other, anybody else's studio. So he's actually housing people. And then he's also filming and doing COVID testing. That's a lot. And it's really expensive. So it makes you think that this is the precedent of what's going to, it's going to take to make these films. Mm. Are we going to have as much film production, which then leaves people like me, who's an actress or even a director out of business as much, or does it allow more room for the indie film market to thrive? Because we're kind of built for this already. We, we've been guerrilla filmmaking. We find ways to make films, whether or not there's a pandemic anyway, mm. with minimal set and crew and all those things. So I think that's what's going to happen, which is why we have so many streaming services popping mm. up left and right between Quibi and Peacock. And I don't even know what else. It's just like, do we need more streaming services or do we just need better content? But the problem is, but even, you know, having more streaming services just means more access to more independent content that may not make it to a Netflix or to an HBO Max or to any of these other platforms. But one thing that I know for sure is that whenever something happens like this or Y2K, this whole thing, whatever, technology always thrives. So what I will say is that it's just going to find a newer camera that can do something crazy or a newer computer with more features, whatever it is, technology is going to thrive through it. And that's going to make it even easier for us to be able to connect or create content. I, I think you're exactly right. I'm, we're, I'm, I'm in the middle of um, a feature film that we're in pre-production on and we've been mm -hmm. exploring um, the Sophia machine, which does the COVID testing in like 18 minutes. And wow. they're hard to buy because the military and the government are snapping them all up, but we're going to have to be equipped with that on the set and test everybody when right. they come on the set. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of other issues with insurance and things like that so um, much. That, 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 that actually support the entire process of making a movie. And so we've got a lot of um, a, some major technical hurdles to uh, overcome. But at yeah. the same time, that makes us leaner, meaner, stronger and better, you know, at what we do. I totally agree with you on that. And the same thing goes with the gallery front. Um, you know, do we need galleries open, you know, mm -hmm. five days a week. Um, I think we should, mm -hmm. I want them to be that way, but right. Um, right now people are opening one day a week and it's only by appointment. So who knows? Um, it's, it's really an interesting time. And I want to thank all of you for being on the panel. Um, Tulsa Kinney, editor of Artillery, I encourage you guys to subscribe to the magazine. Um, if you haven't already, um, read it. It's the most readable art magazine there is that I know of. Hunter um, Joyuhoska Phelps, thank you for coming and thank you for reminding us of all the wonderful writing you've done over the years. But I'm very excited about that new uh, 1970s book because uh, just for personal reasons, it's my living in Los Angeles my whole life has been, you know, it's all about what you're talking about, the personal stories that make the art even more exciting. And uh, Kalima Gaston, thank you very much for being on the panel and for your insights about how technology is going to help us through this. Thank you so and, much. And, and also for what you're doing. Um, and also feel free to reach out anytime on, regarding a film project if you have any need any help or anything like that. Absolutely. And Edward Goldman, thank you very much. Um, I love your art talk show. And now I like your art matters um, and yours too, Hunter. But anyway, thank you everybody for coming. This is recording, so in like by the end of the day, if you have friends who haven't had a chance to see it, 
and you want them to go to our website, um, veniceica.org, um, and uh, that's the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art. And you will be, um, you go to the viewing room and it'll be online for your friends to watch. Um, so thank you all very, very much. This was really fun. I hope you had a good time. Thank you. Uh, and everybody out there, um, I look forward to seeing your art sometime soon or your writing or your filmmaking or whatever it is you're doing. Um, and Stuart, I'm looking forward to seeing that new house when it's finally finished. <laughs> All right, you guys, I'll take it easy. Thanks. Take care. Have a wonderful, safe day. Bye.